Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix Online Meeting 204, uh, our second one in the new year of 2021. Hope everything's going well for you. Um, as always, these meetings are recorded for those of you that are going to catch up with us sometime in the near, hopefully, future. Uh, all right. As always, hey, if you're here, say hi. We'd love to see who's here. I know Jacob's back from vacation because he was chatting with us before we started the stream. Jacob, yes, hola. Um, what are we going to do today? We're going to do some triage because that's what we do. Uh, triage isn't going to be much of triage. It's going to be a lot more of design discussion because we have more design discussion because Sean opened all the bugs and Sean has listed a bunch of things he wants to design discussions. And I, from my work of the last couple of weeks, have queued up some big things to discuss. So we're going to spin all that together and come up with a set of things to talk about. And we'll see how long this meeting goes. And then uh, we'll leave a slice at the end for questions, comments, other things people want to talk about. So uh, hello, everyone. Let's go jump into triage. Bob, you ready? Let's go. All right, triage, here we go. Three issues, as I promised, they're all open by Sean, which, of course, is a interesting um, situation. I'm going to start at the top because... What the heck? This is the newest one, not the oldest one, but um, hey, you only live once. Um, Sean actually brought this up elsewhere, I think on the mailing list, I think I saw it, about including the plan dump, which has a tremendous amount of information in it. Um, but as such, it includes lots and lots of strings and therefore does bloat the size of the burn executable, which we were working really hard in past lives to keep close to uh, 256k, and Sean, I think you said it's up to half a meg now. Um, yeah, 314 is like 450k. 450. All right. So yeah, did we ever hit 256? I don't know that we hit 256. I think we would have hit 256 if we would have done the if we would have stripped the CRT down to the min CRT um, concept. Mm. Um, or we use the built-in Windows um, CRT, which you're not supposed to do. But hey, right. if device drivers can do it, why can't we? Well, the reason is that, technically speaking, they could change it and break everybody that took a dependency on it. And since device drivers have to be built for each OS or something like that, it's apparently okay for them to do that. Anyway, something to that effect. Um, but I think we're down in 300. So we're 314, you said, is 450? Yeah which is still less than half a meg. The world is a little different-ish now. It feels a little different, especially with 5G around the corner. Um, I don't know how many people care about the size of the burn engine. It's never, it's kind of like a personal pride sort of thing, but I don't think anybody's ever asked us, how, how much extra overhead does the burn engine add <laughs> to my install? Um, the, of course, the net downloads are the most interesting ones, um, but I don't know. So if we included the plan into 3.14, Sean, you said it went up to... I actually didn't test it on 3.14, I tested it on 4. No, on 4. I mean, we're not going to do this in 3.14. So on 4, we move to... Uh, well, 4 was is right now around 560 okay and then it would add 5k there are two issues here one is you know adding the the bump for plan dump the second is ooh 560 really because wix 36 burn v36 was 354,816 bytes what's that in k I don't know. That's why I said bytes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We're talking 500k, right, Sean? 560. The total size of the stub is over 500k, but yeah. if just adding plan into the release will only add 5k. It's in total, not not an adder total not an adder. right so the if we take the plan dump as it is it will we will move to 565 we're basically Absolutely. yeah we'll be and that's k so we're still we're just over half a meg and then like i said on the mailing list 
when I added the dutal messages, that was roughly 85k. Right. So those now, were really did that actually come from the from the text of the messages, or was there more code pulled in? No, it's just text no it should have just been the text from the messages. Okay. Again, both of these are things that that increase debugability, and and it's hard to argue against that, even though it's increasing the size, you know, beyond where we want to be. It's also worth pointing out that, of course, the size of the stub also increases um, for 64-bit burn by about 100K. Ah, interesting. Those instructions are bigger. Um, yeah. I don't know. 500K. I mean... <laughs> Plus we start talking about an extensibility model for the engine itself, I don't think there's a lot we can, you know, really get out of that. Get away from, from the engine increasing in size over time. Yeah, I mean, the argument here is less for, like, so you said 85. So we would, if we dropped 80, that'd take us back under 500k. So, I mean, a better argument is to rip out all the deutal logging than to keep the plan dump out, right? If that's a, you know, because I, I I believe the plan dump with the extra verbose logging, um, if it's it's behind the, uh, it shouldn't be in every logging because it's way too much information, but if the extra verbose logging, um, that that's what the debug will get you right, Sean. Am I remembering that yeah. correctly? Yeah, that yeah. the the extra logging like it can be tremendously helpful. For five k, it's probably worth it. Yeah. Agreed. And we could take. But I'd out say the same thing about Dutil. Yeah. So, that, but and I'm not arguing that we should take out the 85k right now either for Dutil. Um, I think we should see that one. I, I've seen the plan dump. I know that when I had it, it was very nice, and I did miss it every once in a while, um, not having it. Um, so yeah. All right. So let's take the plan dump, and we'll see how the Dutil usefulness turns out over time. I still think that's going to be useful for us too. Well, the there's more work to actually see the do-util messages. So that so right now that's kind of dead weight because we're not opting in to the ones we want to see. Ah, right. We're filtering them out. So not really relevant to this issue, but something to think about. Yeah, we we should probably opt in so we can start getting a feel for what the 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 value is. The value and also the cost, right? Because if we start now dumping extra messages, are the logs going to get you know more unwieldy or confusing? Right now, they're 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 kind of, they're at a level that that. You know, sometimes you wish it was just a little bit more. I'm a little concerned that the due to logging will, you know, really bulk them up. It's On the other error hand, cases. we deal with MSI logs, so. Yeah, I mean, but it's mostly in error cases, so. The due to logging is mostly bringing in much more fine-grained detail on errors. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I could just turn on, like, stop filtering them, but can we do that? Like, basically make all the dutal messages debug. So you wouldn't see them unless you turn this yeah, special thanks. flag on. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably the best way to go. By default, logs won't have all the available information. Um, but if you're helping someone debug an issue, you can say, oh, <clears throat> throw in the switch and you'll get more data. Now, yeah. I would also point out that MS Build has this problem, and they solved it with bin logs. Uh, yeah, they they did a couple things with bin logs. The other thing was Corel's viewer to really take the things apart. So, well, yeah, but I'm saying the 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 idea is you include everything, and then you get views of it at the level you're looking for. 
that's harder to do with text logs. Obviously, a lot easier to do with a you know a blob. Yeah. So Jacob, the the issue is that we could leave us only in debug builds, which is what you know they're at there today. I don't know about the util, but all the plan dumps are in debug builds. The problem is that then you have to produce, you have to reproduce your bundle, ship it to a customer who is the only one reproducing the problem potentially, and uh, tell them to install again with a completely different debug bundle. It's like that's a whole lot of process that introduces a lot of variables in there. Um, alternatively, every time you build, you build both a a, a release bundle and one against the debug bundle, just in case you need to send this. Like, that's where all, it just doesn't work out well. Instead, it's a, oh, you've hit this problem that we really need some more additional data to debug. Uh, here, add this extra command line switch or reg key to generate much more detailed logging, and we will then be able, hopefully, that will help us diagnose this hard to diagnose issue. Yeah. Um, and then the hope is that it reproduces, system. right? And if it doesn't reproduce, well, then the that logging was not going to help you. But most of the time, the issues are, you know, this is busted. Help me get it through. Turn on this advanced logging because the normal logging that you sent us that we caught normally didn't help. That's kind of the scenario. Um, so yeah, I, let's let's take the plans up with the extra logging and see where we end up. Sounds good. Do we want to do the switch? The switch. Right now, report debug level messaging only happens if the equivalent switch in the MSI logging policy is set, which is a wee bit awkward. So what log X? That something like that? Something like that, yeah. Or a registry value somewhere. I'm okay with I, I let's do it via registry policy. Burn already has a policy key, so I would let's put it there. Cause this feels like the scenario. And we have both um, don't I, I don't recall off the top of my head whether we have a per user policy. I was hoping key. we did. I hope we did the fall through. I I want to say we should have. Well, I will say we should have. I just don't know if we did it because the only policy right now is where the cache lives. There's per user cache. But yeah, I, I hope we did the fall through. Really should be just something a library that we have. Um, Reading policy. It, actually, we do have a we have a digital module for policy. So maybe we did that. Yeah. Yeah. That feels right. All right, I, I agree with that. I think a logging policy key is the way to do this for now. Because muddying up the command line is just. <laughs> that much more of a um, public surface area. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree. I mean, right. I wouldn't I I'm I'm not opposed to adding, you know, log X. switch. No, it would have to be X log because that sounds cooler. <laughs> I guess that can be a separate issue. Could be. Although it looks like Jacob's pushing us against the 85K for the release. <laughs> yeah, to Jacob's point, I, I, I'm i I'm there. I, I mentioned, I don't know, somewhere, um, this is one of the advantages of ETW logging is that in an ETW event, you just provide the data and there's a separate facility for, for, you know, turning that into English or some other language. Um, it, you know, theoretically, uh, ECW is not the way to go for, for burn logging, however. 
Um, so I use but, ETW logging exclusively for trusted installer because I drank the Kool-Aid way back yeah. then that said this is the correct way to do logging. And it was universally reviled because you couldn't read our log files. <laughs> they were like, right. great, give us a log file. And they're like, okay. And we're like, oh, great. What build was that against? Because you have to have the PDBs to diagnose yeah. Yeah. that. And and it was – and people were like, I just want to read the log file. I could figure it out myself. What? How do I do this? And it, it was a huge, huge problem on that front. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are other ways around it. The 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 model the ECW model of just providing the data is kind of what we already do for the most part. We do have a lot of literal strings, and obviously Dvdl has a bunch of literal strings. Um, you know, all of our exodon failure macros mm -hmm. are yep. are built that way. You know, but the same model could work in a different way. Like, okay, all of these strings are you know resource strings, and you know, you only get them if you include the resource DLL in your bundle, for example. I'm not suggesting it because it would be a pretty big effort for all the all the normal exit on failure work. But there'd be ways of essentially letting you opt in. You know, if you have a you know 500 meg bundle, then 85k is probably not a big concern. So if you have a you know 700k bundle that downloads everything, then yeah, 85k yeah, well, that starts to count, yeah, add up. Yeah. So the yeah, just going along that line, it's, it's almost as if maybe Dudo could use ETW, and you know Plan Dump could use ETW, right, and then. If you want the extended logging, you go get it from ETW, and then, of course, to diagnose that, you have to go and get the, the PDB that goes with it to diagnose the extended logging. But you've already gone off into extended logging land, so there you go. Yep. Um, so and I'll mention again, bin logs make this a whole lot easier because there's always an assumption that you're going to use an external tool to look at the log. We're stuck because we, we want to create text logs. Yeah. Yeah, because we have declarative systems, and the only way to diagnose those reliably is by reviewing the log file. Plus, almost all of our world is post-mortem debugging. So, um, I don't know. All that's bigger than, than now. I mean, to... Yeah. I think we can debate the... I think we can we can look at the world and debate the deutal change. Um, I think the plan dump for now is small enough that we could take it um, and see where it gets us. Um, and maybe in Wix 5, we come all the way back to investigating, reinvestigating, or, or investigating using ETW or something like that out of deutal. Because I'm not even sure if it works well, because libs don't generate PDBs, so I don't know where the ETW stuff lives if you put it in a right. lib. Does it get carried in the symbols that are in the libs that, when they're built, contain the symbols so they can get those symbols into the final PDB? If so, ETW is an option. Anyway, there's a whole lot of stuff to think about, think through there in logging. And honestly, it comes back to the offhand conversations Sean, Bob, and I had I know about what is the best way to do error handling in native code um, mm -hmm. in this this world, and it I think it ties into that as well. Um, is there because like being able to get the stack trace of failures out of Deutal could be very interesting. Um, the same way that we get, and when I say stack trace, like the ability to log that kind of information, the way that when a log, an error hits burn, we get a nice stack trace of error messages that unroll the error as it bubbles up and out of burn, which is immensely helpful when you want to go figure out what line of code failed and burn. Um, and then you hit a deuta call, and the deuta call has lots of functionality in it. Then you're kind of stuck. You're like, well, which part of that went wrong? We know it failed somewhere in here. Yeah. <laughs> which happens. It's not hugely a problem, but it happens. So. All right. Um, any other thoughts? 
Um, that, unfortunately, policy does not support per user policy. Yeah, that's policy util. I, I didn't get into burn itself, but um, why doesn't it? That's so silly. Of us. Policy util or pulk util does not uh, does, does not look support at per it. user at all. Nope. Well, so we have some more work to do to, to do that. Maybe not a lot, but we'd have some. I don't know, Sean. What do you think? I'll just create another issue for that. Okay, where are you where are you going to hide the plan dump fix debug logging behind then? I guess we can make it policy for now, and it's only per machine, and then we can add the ability. Well, to I mean, do it's, per it's already you you can already enable that. Oh, for by MSI. doing the MSI policy. Right, right, right. So worst comes to worst, you get your MSIs get slower because of MSI policy too. That logging on MSI can be pretty a lot slower. Can add time yep. to the MSI install. Okay, yeah, that's that's a good hold for now, and we can come back to debating the policy usage. Um, new minimum OS for V4. Another random thing we discussed. Sean's done a nice job opening a ticket on. Um, what are we going to target for V4? Um, I want to save this for a couple weeks. I think we should talk about this, but I want to talk about this week. Is that all right? Can we come back to this one next time? Yeah, that's good. Rollback boundaries always discard at the, when at the beginning of the chain. And this is based off our discussions about rollback boundaries. It works in V3. I'm... So what's the issue here? Oh, this is the whole discussion about subtransactions. Yeah, we did talk about this particular issue last week. Um, and I, oh, and this is open to me to go investigate. Sorry, I have to punt this for another two weeks because I got myself sucked into the two things that I want to talk about this week before I got to this because I thought they'd be easy and then I forgot about this. So that's my bad. Yeah, this is sitting somewhere near the top of my chain of things to do. Although this needs to be in V4. Yeah, this needs to be in V4. So I think it's part of the reason why I'm not picking it up. So if you could do that, Bob, that would be good. And I will have to come back. That's my bad. I we're gonna go talk about the things that I got my head wrapped around um, that I was doing. So is that all right? All right. So I punted two things the next week. Wow, how efficient a triage is that? <laughs> Sean opens them, you punt them. I know, that's pretty bad. I, I, I make comments in the bugs. That's that's what we're doing. Oh gosh. All right. Well. All right. Well let's let's go and talk about the things that we were that I was staring down last week that doing that. So this list is nice and big. Sean threw in a few in here and I have a couple in here. Um, so I kind of split the difference and we're going to take mine off the top because, well, I maintain the list. I sent the list first. I don't know, whatever. Um, because I said so basically. Um, and then we'll jump into that. And, um, so we're going to talk about the, the win 64 and the debate around changing it to a concept like always 32 bit or something like that. And then I think we'll talk about the redesigned remote payloads. Sean really wanted to talk about that one. Um, so we're going to try those uh, to get through those two and what we have today. Sound good? Yep. I right. think they're both going to take that long. Um, maybe. I, okay. I, I'm maybe. <laughs> if well, not, I mean, then we'll move I'm, on to the next I'm one. I'm fine with doing yours if you think we can get both of them done today. Um, let's. We'll mix them up a little bit. The, I can wait on the inline directory syntax if I get an answer to this one. Um, all right. So the proposal here, this this remove Win64 attribute, basically comes down to a, a few things. Um, number one, the Win64 attribute is should be generally controlled by the architecture switch passed to the compiler. Um, so you should say, hey, when I'm building this package or this merge module or whatever, I am building it for 64-bit or I am building it for 32-bit. And where this comes up is that if you're building it for 32-bit and you have something 
that is set to Win64 yes, well, you've probably made a mistake because including 64-bit content in a 32-bit package is not going to work out um, for you quite right. Um, so so the, I, the thing here is that Win64 as a control bit, what people tend to do is they don't know about the architecture switch because, well, it came later in Wix 3, and then they end up doing these nasty preprocessor things to try to set Win64 correctly everywhere, and it just ends up becoming a really complicated mess. So the idea being that, hey, including 64-bit stuff in a 32-bit package isn't something that you would do, but including 32-bit stuff in a 64-bit package absolutely is something that you could do. Um, because of WOW, the ability, WOW 32, the ability to run 32-bit stuff on a 64-bit machine, says, hey, what if we get rid of Win64 and we replace it with always 32-bit? The name's not great, but it was trying to just get across the concept of, hey, if you say this is always 32-bit equals yes, then when you build it in 32-bit, well, of course, it's 32-bit. And then if you build it for 64-bit, then, hey, look, it stays 32-bit. And it would generally be a rare thing, and you wouldn't see it. Um, so the name notwithstanding, like, we're just going to say, let's not worry about the name for now. Um, so I'm a little, I'm actually a little surprised you're still referring it to like that because Mike's pull request, he said that we already discussed this and changed it to architecture. To architecture? Yeah. Where did his pull, that's not it. Neither one of these is it. That's why I made the comment with the link so you can just. Uh, so, and default, right. So, okay, this is, right. So switching to architecture and setting always 32-bit and default, right. I, I knew the problem wasn't solved because the this is the end result saying, yeah, it's going to behave the same. You can set an architecture. Instead of saying Win64, you would say um, architecture, and you would be able to put the value of always 32-bit or default in there, and default being, well, whatever the compiler is currently compiling. And as I was going around, something was always, it was just bugging me a little bit about this. And uh, the... The issue is that, as I went through this, I was like, libraries don't work this way. Libraries can continue, can and do, in the case of the Wix toolset, contain both 32-bit and 64-bit content in them at the same time. So setting an architecture on a library is fine if you want to default a whole bunch of stuff a particular way. But a lot of times, for example, in the .NET frame, in the NetFX Wix lib, we build 32-bit and then we explicitly set a few things Win64 because they are Win64 isms, and they live in fragments that you then call out and say, hey, I want the 64-bit search as opposed to the 32-bit search. And that makes sense because a lot of the .NET framework stuff is 32-bit, or they write in the 32-bit registry, so all that stuff, you know, all the searches find everything and things like that. And then if you want to explicitly look for something 64-bit, there are those called out and available. Which means that this idea here of being able to say default and always 32-bit doesn't work unless you were to go through and say, hey, build your Wixlib as 64-bit and then go mark everything that is 32-bit as always 32-bit, which in the case of NetFX would be everything but like two things, like two, two registry searches or something like that. Um, so I want to bring it back and go, I don't know if that's the right thing to do, and instead, do we need something along the lines of always 32-bit, always 64-bit, and then default? And then when I went to always 64-bit, do we need to have something that says always x64 and always arm to call out the difference between uh, x64 and arm64? And I didn't think so, but then I didn't do a lot in the ARM stuff, so then I stopped there and kind of went, um, what is the right way to solve this? And so here I am looking for input on what people think the best way to tackle this, knowing that there are cases where you will want to be able to explicitly declare something 64-bit mixed in with a bunch of 32-bit stuff 
typically in the use of libraries, not in packages. Did I explain that well enough? Yeah. I'll say that there's very little, there's nothing ARM specific about 64 bitness in the realm we're talking about. This is just an MSI ism exposing a Windows ism that, oh, Windows ism, that sounds weird. Um, that, that, you know, 32 bit and 64 bit worlds are, are, you know, completely parallel, um, which, you know, made sense back when, when 32, um, came about with versus Win 16, um, but is now just weird. Um, the, the good news is that for the most part, the, the horrible, um, preprocessor stuff is either no longer needed or in some cases no longer possible uh, because you can no longer set the architecture of a package in the authoring. Um, mm -hmm. Huge swaths of, of the extensions now require that you specify Arch when you build. Mm -hmm. So the 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 need for the preprocessor in order to, you know, have a single source for both platforms, again, either no longer needed thanks to program files 6432 folder, is that what you named it? Yep. And, or it's not possible as in, you know, what was it? Product slash platform. Um, I, I'm, so all this said, the original idea that you could just default or force a 32 bit component or whatever um, makes sense. I'm still not clear on what you're proposing or not proposing because of libraries. Well, I'm, I'm wondering if with this architecture concept here, do we have a, do we need to add, I, I'm proposing, and I wanted to validate the idea that I think we need an always 64-bit to go along with the always 32-bit. Yeah, okay. Um, you need to dig into that because I'm not seeing a scenario where you're building something. That, the, the problem that I think we're trying to solve is the fact that you, know, you, you can't put 64-bit stuff in a 32-bit package. Um, so even though we're talking about libraries, I'm not sure. So if you have a library that is 99% 32-bit and 1% 64-bit, with this change, with the always 32-bit thinking, you would have to go through and mark 99% of your library as 32-bit. Build your library 64-bit, mark 99% of your library as 32-bit to get that 1% as 64-bit by default. Um, okay, so that's, I guess I, I don't, um, that seems weird because what you're proposing is that you basically have one library and you build it for x64. It's not just that you build it for 64-bit. You have to pick one of the 64-bit architectures. But all of our libraries I mean, work this way inside extensions. They contain both 32-bit and 64-bit um, code in them. They have 32-bit, 64-bit stuff. So if you want to explicitly pull in a 64-bit, like the 64-bit .NET framework search, you ask for the .NET framework 64, whatever, to get a 64-bit search because normally .NET framework searches are all 32-bit because the .NET framework is 32-bit on your machine. Right, but that that all works because we build the library per architecture. No, the library is only built once it contains per architecture binaries in it, but the library has no architecture. Sorry, the library has no architecture. It contains fragments that are built per architecture. Uh, has fragments that, yes, it has fragments in it, and some of them are, yeah, architecturally specific, yes. So, problem solved. No, because there's only one command command to put it all into one library. 
So I'm not sure why. That's a, that's that's a problem. That's a build tools I'm, problem. I'm not sure why we need to change the Win64 on searches. I don't think we should mess with that. In burn, they work regardless of the bundle's fitness. That's correct. I don't know. I don't know about the MSI searches, though. I know that paths paths are always munched. You you can't have you can't refer to a 64-bit path from a 32-bit package. They always get substituted, which usually sucks, but. It's not usually what people wanted. <laughs> when the stall is being yeah. one step too smart for them, not that never happened. <laughs> um, well, it was the whole wow concept of really you yeah. are switching between. No, clearly you meant program files 32, not program files. Um, yeah. Of course, this is when program files 32 was being introduced at the same time. So, anyway, um, not non-trivial problem there. All right, so let's see. If we took searches out of this and said searches are not, searches are always, I guess. Hmm. Well, I mean, like the behavior doesn't change because of the architecture switch, or it shouldn't. Mm, registry keys. Which registry keys? Yeah. Registry keys behaviors change radically. They change the route that they search. Well, I guess that's a problem if MSI searches work that way. Mm, burn are the same way. If you do a burn 32-bit switch, it searches the burn 30, searches the 32-bit registry, not the 64-bit registry. You have to go through the syswow kind of. No, but if you if you have a Win64 equals no search, whether you build your bundle 32-bit or 64-bit, it's going to search the 32-bit registry. Right. That's true. And I, I don't even think that that does Win64 equals no have an effect on a util search? Win64 equals no? No, it does. I, I mean, I that's mean, the default. It, it's the default. If that's what you're asking. Well, I, I'm, no, I'm saying, I'm saying Win64 equals no has an effect for an MSI build for, for all the bits of, of MSI. Well, it doesn't um, work in burn because burn only builds. Uh, 32 bit today so well, burn today yes so but, i mean yeah but but uh, sorry i guess where i'm going with that is now that we're getting 64 bit burn oh eventually yeah. um uh, does yeah. that mean that that burn or util searches should behave like the msi searches i want to say no because the msi search behavior is just wrong yeah i'm gonna um, say no <laughs> I, I, I like you know the thing about the burn stuff is that it's like you you don't have to worry about the um, are you going to get a you know a while wow 64 32 node path out of a registry search you're going to get a 32 bit one unless you explicitly look at the 64 bit registry for example okay and that's kind of why I like I like the model as it's proposed regardless of how the attribute works. Um, for M it it makes the most sense for MSI. Yes, I I, I agree with that. That it makes this that this works well in an MSI. Where it doesn't work well is in a Wixlib, where a Wixlib can be can contain content for both architectures. Right. And so now my thing, my confusion. Um, so in the Wix three model, you can compile all of your fragments into Wix objects and then lit them into a library that contains those multiple fragments, those multiple per architecture fragments, and it's perfectly fine as long as there's no ID overlap. True. What are we doing in Wix 4 to make that possible? And I'm especially curious because theoretically we've already done it. I have to go look. The, the question is, can you take, can you um, bind uh, Wix lives together? And I think the answer is, I, I, I don't know, whatever we decided there, I ha, I'd have to go look. 
it hasn't come up in a long time of um, can you bind can the input to the lib command be um, another Wix lib? Except we don't even have a lib command. Yeah, it's just built. I'm curious so what what's happening today. I, I'm genuinely curious because, um, you know, we have util extension that has three architectures in it. Yeah, it it just includes. So what the, the hell bounds. actually happens today? It just builds. Well, it's the same as it was before. There's only one Wix lib. An extension only has one Wix lib. Right. So but I'm saying, to, in in v three, we compile these fragments separately in separate steps, and they would get the correct architecture radically. Now I don't. That might actually be incorrect. Um, and it might be that we're we're just hard coding because actually, like today in in Wix four, the util Wix proj does not contain a an architecture switch. Right. I don't I don't think V three had one extension with multiple architectures inside of it. No, it has util. Util was one we built because of ARM. And and it actually no, it, had, but it, it was it was util ARM. Uh, we also had x64. Yeah, there were a couple of x64 things that were not x86 with, you know, wow knowledge. Well, not not really. Yeah. Like, what was a 64-bit util? Like, it was compiled as x86. Yeah, it was also compiled as x64, and in fact, in 3.14, was compiled was also compiled as ARM64. Because I did that one. Um, I guess I guess the extension has multiple. Yeah, the extension, see, the extension has multiple. No, the extension had one. No, it had multiple libraries. No, I don't think it did. No, we yeah, first. I'm... Well, no, I think it. No, I think. See, it had no, one. I... There is only one util Wix lib. There's only one Wix lib in an extension today. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And that but it Wix lib contains building... multiple architectures in it. Correct. Mm -hmm. It has binaries that have multiple architectures. Mm, and, and all the other stuff that goes with that. Um, Not like, like NetEffect really. has both 64-bit and 32-bit searches in it. So like, under your, there's a Wix lib and there's a Wix lib arm. There's two different folders there. The arm library was never included in the extension. Because for 32-bit ARM, you had to be Microsoft or a partner to run 32-bit to run on, to run native code on 32-bit ARM. That's ARM yeah, 32, but, not ARM 64. ARM 64 when, is all. all ARM. <laughs> I understand that, but when, when you built that, how would someone actually use that? You created you a separate the, extension, right? No, you you pass the Wix, the ARM Wix lib on the command line. The IDs are all the IDs are all platform specific. Which is why this works. So when it you know looks for a reference to an ARM custom action, it won't find it in the extensions library, and, but it'll then go look at the rest of the command line. Oh, there's another Wix lib. There it is. It ends up falling out of the extension essentially and landing in this Wix lib. It, it was a it was a kind of it was a hacky kind of solution that oh, got around the fact. Hack. I mean, the whole thing was a hack. The 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 whole way the ARM worked was a hack. So. Um, and the only reason it was done was because the VC readist and the remote debugger needed it. Um, yep. And I don't know that anybody else ever used any of this stuff. And it just so happened that I worked in Visual Studio and Bob was working for Visual Studio in some capacity at that point or something like that. I forget. Mm -hmm. And we basically said, uh, fine, you guys are paying us. We will figure out a way to make this work. And so we did. And that was kind of the way we landed without doing tremendous amounts of terrible things 
Um, well, it also this solved the problem of how do you sign the custom action binaries? Well, that was the, that was that. the core problem. That was the core yeah. problem is that we had to sign these binaries with a magical key that only Windows had. Yeah. And so it was like, all right, well, here's this thing. Hand it off to the people that had the conversations with Windows to go get it signed so it will run on these magical architecture, uh, on this magical architecture, and then come back. And so, anyway, it was normal ARM. We need to like purge ARM32. <laughs> more and more oh, yeah. we talk about it, the more and more we need to purge ARM32 from our history. Yes, working. I know it's gone in Wis4, and we need to not refer to it necessarily as a good thing. Um, although, Diffix app is kind of did a similar kind of trick, I think, is where we got the idea. So, well, yeah, Diffix app did that though because they did not make the IDs unique per platform, so they we couldn't mm. have a single word slip. They had kind of the opposite problem, and we didn't own it. We didn't own it, and we that. didn't own it. Yeah, so that was yeah. a problem. Anyway, <sighs> okay, so so all uh, basically right now, okay, so we have this problem where we do put these multiple architectures into a Libraries. single Wix slip. Correct. The IDs are all distinct by platform, so that all works. Yep. So now we come to the problem of we're building by default for x86. I don't see that changing. I mean, we could flip it, and we could say let's build by default for a 64-bit, but then, of course, 64-bit's fun because there's multiple to choose from. Um, yeah, exactly. But the um, point is that in most of our Wix slips today, given the things that they refer to, literally 99% of it is 32-bit references yeah, sure. with a couple 64-bit references. Yeah, agreed. So the defaulting to 32-bit makes a lot of sense for them right now. And the ability to yeah. set win 64 equals yes on you know, a couple things gets the behavior you want. And with this yeah. proposal, I would be removing that and I would be forcing everything to go to architecture always 32-bit <laughs> on all those 32-bit things. And that's where I went, this doesn't look right. Right, right. Well, so I, I would flip it. We're, we're still going to build for x86 by default because it is a reasonable default. Um, although really we want architecture equals none um, when we're building a library like this. Um, but yeah, but okay. you're right, we still need the Win6, we need the ability to say Win64 equals yes. Sometimes. That's in these cases. Okay, so does that mean we take the architecture switch and we add always 64-bit and we go from there? Um, <laughs> probably. I'm I'm a little concerned. So I'm a little concerned because really what we should probably be doing is making it easier to build a library that contains multiple that contains fragments that were compiled per architecture. Again, right now what we're we're accomplishing this issue, we're accomplishing this yep. this Yep. Solution in the authoring. So, what if with, architecture was a switch that you could set on the fragment? <laughs> yes. And what if that meant you could also opt in to having, you know, suffixes on your IDs? Oh, gosh. Yeah. This is, <laughs> I, I kind of didn't want to go there. Because um, this is the biggest, you, the biggest reason people use the preprocessor yeah, um, templating. Is, is to template this stuff. And it's hard to argue that, you know, because we don't have another solution, it's the only way to do things. Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, I, I, I know the templating scenario, and it didn't make the cut in Wix 4. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, but it's, it's <laughs> in Wix 5, it's one of the things I stare at going, um, <laughs> it's actually a two punch thing. Hey, little hint to this. Yes, there is a future with five. And you really want me to scare you? It's my one two punch of um add templates, remove preprocessor. <laughs> Which would be like, what? And I'm like, yes. But it basically gives us a thing of the one good use of includes, 
templates and then get rid of includes, you'll still get variable substitution. We're not going to get rid of that part, but the whole if this, else that, and, or the includes of this versus that, I, we'll still have to have if, you know, some conditional stuff, but there are other ways of doing that. Anyway, that's not here nor there. Um, Rob um, the radical socialist. <laughs> what? I'm just improving Take the language. Take my preprocessor from my cold, dead fingers. Yeah, well. Uh, anyway, yes, yes, you, you, yeah, you have the, I have the gist of it. Yeah. You know so, the problem. Yeah, yeah. You know the problem. Um, that's why I was like, if I just add always 64-bit, the problem I'm exposing is people will now try to set preprocessor variables when they're building 64-bit yeah. to these so that they can always right, right. force them all the way through. I'm like, ah, uh, which is the whole thing we're trying to avoid by not exposing the toggle. <sighs> well, and that's why I, I I did kind of prefer the idea of a, of a always 32-bit or force 32-bit um, just because right. the, the the name is important in, in determining what people try to do. Again, the good news is this isn't going to work, right, because of the whole product and um, package switch up that I did a while back. You can no longer do everything in authoring. But uh, right, uh, right, that, you're right. That is a it, it's it's a it's a big it's a big step. And of and program file 6432 folder addresses the other uh, common thing that you do. Um, and maybe we can, uh, you know, maybe that's enough to say, and not just, you don't need to worry about this. Yeah. Because again, that's what they were doing is basically setting the default value per platform. And now you just do that by, you know, compiling with the, with the arch switch. Right. Have we lost Jacob yet? I'm curious if Jacob is following along with us here. Last thing he said was about the only Microsoft support OS is so I'm kind of he's like, oh, whatever. And I'm just filling that space. So <laughs> that's a bug that you guys. No, punt, punt, punt. Yeah, yeah. All right, got this guy but still here. All right, okay. Um, all right, so if we back up a little bit though. Um, if we, so I, I've been thinking something about Sean said in the beginning, which was searches should be explicit about which architecture they're targeting, or rather they shouldn't be affected by this switching. I guess it's saying the same thing. Um, if that's true, then I have to admit most, I think of the cases where I saw Win64 being explicitly used, and I'm going to, I'm doing a quick scan of the Wix in the Wix code is all of these I think are searches. I, yeah, it would surprise me if it was anything else. I mean, really, um, it's searches, components, and script custom actions, right? That's where MSI cares. Um, I thought there was something else, but um, it doesn't come to mind, but it's possible. Those are the big ones. And script custom actions are, yeah, just go away. So if searches don't, don't flow with the architecture, does that make, does that make sense? That means you have to condition a 64-bit search on a 64-bit build. Okay. Or how we can throw it away. That we haven't talked about doing that in the past, but it basically be an implicit condition on it. It's like, hey, we encountered a search that says it's 64 bit. You're building a 32 bit package. We're going to throw the search away. I mean, that feels wrong. Can you have a? I don't even know if you can have a. Can you have a 64 bit search on a 30 bit package and have it work? No. Yes, the search works, but again, it always returns a munch, a wow path. Oh, does it? I see. So you said make this 64-bit, but it doesn't in the end. It's being helpful. <laughs> hey, you said search for this is 64-bit, but you're a 32-bit package, so you're going to go search in 32-bit land. Um, so... 
if search is then well then uh, if searches explicitly have to say whether they're 32 bit or 64 bit is that a good thing or should they travel with the underlying package or the underlying build if you're building for 64 bit and you write a search do you want to have to write that it's a 64 bit search or that it's or that it's a 32 bit search well today wix does default the search bitness to the package bitness right yes it does and I, i'm trying to work through the the concept that sean is saying of maybe they shouldn't and we're just talking about msi here right no it's going to hit i mean it wasn't a thing for burn, but it's going to be a thing for burn too. So we need to talk about burn too, um, bundles well, as well. I I don't I don't want it to affect burn. I don't want it to flow with architecture and burn. I certainly agree with burn. Okay, because burn already has the right model, which is that a 32-bit bundle can look into 64-bit portions of the file system and the oh, registry. I see. How helpful. Yeah. Um, so so the, the models could be different and probably should be different. Um, no, 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 is, no. Here's the question. If you're building a 32-bit bundle mm -hmm. and you have a search in it, sorry, if you're building a multi-architecture bundle, which we've not had in the past, and you have a search specified in it, and that search doesn't say anything about architecture, should it always search for a 32-bit key? Oh, crap. I would say yes, because that's how it's worked in V3. It was never an issue because... Because you got... V3 lets you build an X64 bundle, in quotes, X64. But that would have been a 32-bit search. Yeah, you could do a multi-architecture bundle, theoretically, because we supported ARM as well. ARM32. I know we're not supposed to talk about it anymore. But, um, but that didn't really – that wasn't a problem because x86 and ARM32 were both 32-bit. If – searches flow with the architecture, then architecture always 32-bit works. Well, not yeah, but we, we still not need numbers. yeah, we still need 64-bit support for the library case, though. So. Yeah, and then you still need always 64-bit. Yeah. Okay. Right. If you have to be explicit, then basically searches are taken out of the table taken off the table and you have to go specify it anyway so win 64 or some other attribute if we get rid of it 64 to get rid of its connotations right purely to get rid of its connotations but its behavior is the same then yeah it's yeah same thing different thing whatever um yeah when 60 the proposal is win 64 equals yes no default win 64 right i guess that's true I, I, well, I agree. We need. We should rename it with better avoid. names. Yes, with better names. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, no, no, no. Right now, the proposal doesn't have a yes in it. It just has no or default. And I'm bringing up the fact that I think we need yeah. Billy to say yes. Sorry, I I took that as a given. Okay, the, the library okay. Case. got it. Got it. Okay, then I think we're on the same library. Page. Until we get templates, the library case requires it to be trinary. Uh, the template solve is probably yes. Um, so if we take searches out and you always have to specify and then we're back to you know preprocessor mangling yeah that that's the thing i'm thinking about it's like not having 60 not having had a 64 bit bundle i don't know if i'd want the registry the the searches to move back and forth so, no they, they really shouldn't because most of your searches well 
most of your searches are probably already explicitly 64-bit, or they're they're you know already preprocessor guarded, right? Because if you're doing a search for some third-party app, you're going to have to go look in the registry for where that thing lives, and that might change. I mean that might maybe 50, 80% chance it's going to change based on the bitness of the OS. So, and I've seen this authoring certainly in bigger products like Visual Studio where they have both searches authored. They have a 32-bit search and then a 64-bit search. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and, you know, most of the detection is, you know, 32 or 64. Um, so, following oh, maybe maybe it's just the 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 searches aren't necessarily tied to the bundle business. The searches are almost always tied to some other product's business. So, following the bundle business is not the eighty percent case. I would argue it's also not the eighty percent case for MSI, but that's perhaps a different discussion. Mm, well, that's where I'm going next. <laughs> is yeah. I, yeah, I didn't say it was it was a far away discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um I well, okay, I'll just say it. I I think it's probably wrong in both cases. That searches should be explicit about their business. Kinda, but again, mostly because I think already we have this we have this problem that again it's not so much the business of your app, but some other thing. Yeah. Yeah. So probably this is something people have solved either with preprocessor or with with having multiple searches. Right, and I guess here's where a template yes. would be kind of cool. Yeah, I guess now I'm thinking about it. Like, how often do you have a search for both 64-bit and 32-bit? Um, if you're looking for something, probably not very often. If you need generally, it, you already have generally. to. Yeah, I mean, but generally, how often does that problem happen? And it probably doesn't happen that often, right? Like, no, if you're because... looking for something else, it writes in one of those. It doesn't write in both. Right, right. This is the this is the the you know nineteen or I don't know two thousand one model of you know you're going to have both thirty two bit and sixty four bit versions of your app installed and that's why we need two separate program file program files folders yes. um, and that of course is not how it turned out um, yeah it's like, okay I I am an add in for Photoshop I'm going to look for what is probably the 64-bit path for Photoshop. Because I don't think you can get 32-bit anymore. <laughs> well, that right there makes it really easy. <laughs> yes, agreed. But um, you're right. But at that point, you're saying, I want 64-bit search. And then it only turns into, which one do we default to? Do we default to 32 or default to 64? And I think Sean said we default to 32, because that's the way it's always been. Um, and I don't know about that. That, that that's wrong, or we could also make it. I don't know if we want to make it explicit all the time. Okay, so let me ask this question, because I, I in this conversation we've we've been using a particular word, and um, I want to make sure that we have the proper uh, adjective or noun, whichever it is, to go with it. Um, what is the word for architecture that means a uh, 32-bit or 64-bit, um, where you know there are multiple values for either of those 32-bit or 64? In our case, there are multiple values for 64-bit, um, both AMD 64 and ARM 64. What is the word to describe that? It's not where architecture probably describes ARM 
and uh, x86 and x64 or AMD64, whichever you want to pick there, um, IA64, which we don't care about anymore, ARM32, which we don't care about anymore, but you know, MIPS, so on and so forth. That's if that's architecture. What's the thing that describes Windows's 64 or 32-bit? Believe it or not, the Microsoft documentation uses the the word bitness. No way. It does. I, I was almost always, positive that they were not going to use that I know, word. I know. Me too. Because that, that's how, of course, I refer to it. Because what else are you going to use? Uh -huh. But yeah, uh, documentation uses the word bitness, which I love. So does that mean that searches get a bitness attribute on them instead of Win64? I mean, essentially, Win64 is actually saying bitness. Yes. Um, I... I I will I will abstain from voting because I just really want it to be business. Okay, well you, that's your vote, Sean. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean business sounds good to me. And is the value thirty-two bit, thirty-two and sixty-four, or is it thirty-two bit and sixty-four bit? Like, because it's not x eighty-six and something else. I don't know. <laughs> that's not helpful. Well, it's interesting because, you know, in my head, I don't want 32 in front of it because that's not a valid identifier, but we don't have that problem. Hmm. Um, I'd be okay with either, but... 32 think... is, yeah, 32 is interesting. It can't be an enum if it's 32. Wait, do the values in XSD enum... Have to be identified. Oh, I don't know if they do, but if if you want to try to use it as in code, then you're going to get trapped. So it it generally comes back to bite us in the end. But I mean, well, you can that's spell that's it out. The... Thirty-two. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was that? I'll spell it oh, out. <laughs> Capital -E T -E or lowercase -E t. -E -S. You know, it has to be lowercase s i x t y f o u r. Oh wait, no, it's capital F, right? Yes, capital F. Lowercase s, capital F. Uh -huh. um, it, but in that case, 32 and 64 won't work, even if you say bit, 32 bit, 64 bit. It's still not a valid identifier. Yeah. Or we could go with bitness and we could say it's always 32, always 64, or it's default, and it flows with the architecture of the build. <laughs> you know, actually, <laughs> there, there's something to be said that, that we should retain that capability. At least, oh God, at least for MSI. Okay. Uh, Sean, do you have any opinions on that concept? Not really. <laughs> So if yeah. if this here then changes Win64 to from architecture to bitness, because I think when we said this, we didn't have ARM64 in mind. Um, so knowing that ARM64, that there are multiple 64s um, in the world, then if we change this attribute, so if we revise Mike's comment here again and say, no, the new attribute is going to be bitness, then it would have always... 32, always 64, and default? Yeah. Yeah. Then that straightens out the whole thing, and I think everything gets sorted um, appropriately now. Right. And then we only have the problem in that some people may still try to use preprocessor variables to, to set the always 32 and always 64, but We 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 can't avoid that. No, that, yeah. people are always going to try, you know, to do something. It's it's going to take, you know, time to to get the Wix four variants of Stack Overflow answers um, above the fold. Um, oh God! I didn't and if someone wants to do that, that's fine. I mean, you know, yeah, again, yeah, it's, it's not the, wrong. The, the, there's, it's, it's ugly. Not it's wrong. not wrong. It's and, ugly. But you know, right now. Again, it's like if you care about it, you probably you know either already have the preprocessor stuff or you have multiple searches. So, well, 
we've already done the uh, you know a lot of work to uh, well Wix three you had to use the preprocessor right there was no way to to switch yeah, out no, the was, and, and program was, files folder yeah and, and and I have a couple projects that I maintain where it's just like the, at, sharp edge just grates on me that I have these like th two um, preprocessor variables that I had to like just <laughs> yeah, bend exactly. into submission with preprocessor variables, and it made me yep. very sad. So we've made it possible now to do the common stuff. You know, yes, so bitness would have solved the problems that I had. Yeah, in my build. Um, well, I'm just I'm thinking of the you know the arch switch addresses the how you used to specify the platform in authoring. Mm -hmm. um, Program files 6432 folder. Solid. Oh, yeah. That, that's another program one. files folder. Yep, that one. And for the most part, people didn't need to worry about the rest. That's most true. people, when they did the preprocessor stuff, they did do a Win64 variable. That's true. Um, but for the most part, it was unnecessary yeah. if they used Arch. If they used Arch, it was unnecessary, except in the few cases where you had 32 bit stuff in a 64 always 32-bit stuff in a 64-bit package well, but Thus, that's where win64 the, equals no still works correct unnecess correct. unnecessarily use the preprocessor oh, yes. variable because they thought correct. they had to correct and the fact but, that def the the default of win64 was a no like the explicitly putting a no is generally yeah. a, a a mistake in our language design given the fact that right. no is supposed to be the default everywhere right so this solves that. If we have bitness and we have always 32, I assume I remove the bit off the end, the word bit off the end, so it's always 32, always 64. I'm fine with that, yeah. Especially since I couldn't decide if I liked uppercase bit or lowercase bit. Um, that's, Against the digit, it's a problem. Yeah. It, was, it was just like, oh. Um, and then default, which will give us the behavior, and then everything will flow down from that. Plus one. Great. All of that to get to the point where I was basically like, I think we need a 64-bit statement. And we did. We just had to come up with the name of it. But and I imagine that six changed. years ago, we spent the same amount of time discussing this. Uh, well, yeah. It, it wasn't... We were missing some data. Um, yeah. ARM64 changes it quite a bit, I think. Yeah, I think ARM64 changed it. Okay. Um, redesign remote payload, Sean? You think we can do it in like 10 minutes or? Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a no. <laughs> that's as strong a statement as you get from Sean. Uh, <laughs> hesitation. Nope. Um, all right. Let's queue it up and see where we go. Bob asked me, so you think we'll get through them all? <laughs> yeah, I really regret saying that on the record now. Uh, redesign remote payload. Uh, Sean, the floor is yours. I'm I'm not sure where we're coming at with this one. Is it the whole thing? Yeah, so there's two ah. things I want to do. The first thing is get rid of the magic thing where the package can use the first payload as the entry point. Like, I don't like that. And then the second part is uh, remote payload is currently used in two different places, exe package and NMSU package. Mm -hmm. But people have asked for it in MSI package and for just general payloads. Mm -hmm. But in all those cases, the required attributes that you'll be, you, that you have to specify will be different for each one. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to <laughs> have, I don't want to use that in all the different places. So I'm hoping what I want to do is create a different element for each scenario where it will be used. And then I wrote up the proposal as doing it to where it will be a child element of the package. And then you'll each of those elements will have it, their own special attributes. But then we're also going to take off the source file, we're going to make it not possible to specify that payload stuff in the package element. You have to specify it inside of the special one that we're creating. 
You have to with specify the one something exception. that ends in payload. So for the one exception is we're going to leave source file in there for the common case where you just have the file and you just want to use that file. You had the file. Well, like that was it, my feedback on Wix devs that source having a simple um, package element with a source file is probably the most common case. Oh yeah. By so far. again, the the eighty you know eighty twenty it, it shouldn't require a child element, yes. especially XML, um, just to get you know the the most common case. Yeah. Okay. I right agree with that. Remove. But I also agree. I like the idea of removing the um, the the various attributes that deal with with payloads, because if ah. you're gonna if you're gonna follow a path, you know, if you're gonna go down that path, fine. Then a child element is you know, is a lot more reasonable. Okay, so we're still gonna have XE package, MSI package, MSP package, MSU package, and maybe one day bundle package. And you will be able to put source file on it. And if you do that, then you can't specify anything else about that source file. You, you can't specify any of the over the package type specific attributes, like visible. Like visible equals yes, no. You wouldn't be able to do no. that. You'd have you to. Could, visible is not a payload attribute. Oh, it's a package attribute, right? I see. So how are those payload attributes different? How is the MSI package payload? What's on the MSI package payload that's not on the XE package payload? MSI is a bad example because that means all of the product code, upgrade code, reduction. Okay, so it's those things. On it. So visible, wait, but visible is a package level thing? Yeah. You, you have visible on an XE package? Well, Hmm. No, no, you can't. But, but it, that's an MSI package specific. Like that's that's right. referring to the the package. Okay. Not to the MSI file. Okay, so it's kind of like the attributes we pass to the MSI versus the inherent things that we harvest out of the MSI. Yeah, everything harvested is moving to this new one. Except I'm not actually implementing that here that would be that's a separate feature request to to be allow able to specify a, to create a remote a MSI, MSI package payload. right your proposal is basically to allow the um is, is to allow the feature in the future but it would also support like um, a random file as a payload not package payloads is that close to accurate? I'm not sure I understand the yeah, random I didn't file get that. part. I'm sorry. Fan. Right now, you can you can have a payload. You can add a payload. Right. If like if an XE requires another payload. Uh -huh. the, this your proposal here would allow those things to be remote payloads. That's a separate feature request. Oh, okay. Okay. So when do you need to use, what scenario do I need to use MSI package payload today? If, like if you want to specify a download URL, for instance. Ah. Remember, we also, this is related to the other, uh, to another uh, thing about payloads, which is like in V3 at least, you can't specify that something has a download URL. Uh, oh wait, no. How does this work? If it's in an attached container. Attached container. Thank you. That's the, you know, that one. Of the, hey, more preprocessor stuff. Um, the, you know, you have to specify a source file for an MSI because we harvest stuff mm -hmm. from it. Um, mm -hmm. You want to be able to to create both a you know single XE download and a quote unquote web skew. You can't do that today without without preprocessor hell. Why? Because you can't break 
up an element with the preprocessor. So you need two elements that are identical, except for you know the couple of attributes. Which I don't know. Maybe you could maybe you could do it with with. Well, um, if you want, you're saying you want a bundle that has everything compressed in it. I'm saying. It's not uncommon to want to create two SKUs. One is a single XE download that contains everything with okay. attached containers. The other is a, I don't know how else to refer to it, a web SKU mm -hmm. that contains just the, you know, the, the bundle and BA, right? Everything oh, 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 and the, but I see. And when you're doing compressed, if you specify in a download URL on it, then... Compressed and you, download URL you, are incompatible, yes. Right. Then, right. So this comes back to something I've written up before but have never figured out how to make work, which is the idea that you specify packaging stuff at packaging time, not at compilation time. Right. Yeah. Now that I that definitely is something that we'd love to see. Another MSI or Wix five feature that. Yeah. This is well. This is for. a template. Right, this is a template. Uh, I, maybe, yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, yeah, it's kind of the, it's the presets outside. Like, build my yeah. stuff this way. All right. Um, I'm missing how this helps. Oh, because it downloads URLs on a element, you can now if def the element. Whether you're building a web SKU or whether you want it, so you can say one's compressed and one's not compressed, and on the not compressed one, you can say the da provide download URL. Gotcha. At the very least, it means you don't have to duplicate, which is what you have to do today with like NetFX packages. You don't have to duplicate all of the detection logic um, just because you have a different payload. Right. That's the big win. That was the, my original uh, thing for opening the issue way back when was we're, we're mixing up the delivery mechanism with the, you know, business logic kind of of the package do you read do you visualize xsd sean well because i have a hard time when i do it like this i can just copy what i did yeah i, I understand that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, i'm i'm just trying to look for the examples like my, this is my visualization efficiency kicking in. It's like I'm, I'm trying to visualize the common I'll cases here. Yeah, the, ex the examples. Like, you look, here's the 90% case. Fragment, package group, or, you know, or chain, or whatever, and then MSI package source equals this. Done. If you want to customize what? If you want to customize the download URL, then it has to look like this. Um, which is breaks out in separate separate element, and then because of that, the third scenario is now you can create both a com attached container SKU and a non and the web SKU by having these two elements if deft and note that this is much smaller than what would have been copied in the past, right? And that's the win, and that's essentially the progression of wins here for the loss, the more complicated. It, which is the hey, um, download URL used to be able you used to be able to create a single MSI package with a download URL on it all in one line. Now that takes two elements instead of one. If that well, it never worked for MSIs. It would only work for XEs. But why did it not work for MSIs? Product code upgrade table. No, you can have MSI package download URL all that stuff. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yes, not remote, not remote. I meant downloads. Yes, sorry. Yeah, and then remote for MSI packages, it's a lot of typing, um, but yeah. Okay. But is that, that's the three scenarios? Those are the big three scenarios that I'm, I'm, is there any other big scenarios that I'm missing other than those three, that progression of code? Is that, that's the progression? Like start with a single line. If you need to download URL, split it. That's unfortunate, but hey, look, you get this benefit because if you want to have both attached and um, download, then you can create, you just have to duplicate this one, the new element you added, as opposed to all the other stuff. Did I get that right? 
Yeah, that's right. And there's there's no other. Are there any other scenarios that I'm not that I've I've missed? Well, I mean, the other benefits are that, like, if we wanted to enable remote MSI package, we would have to put a bunch of attributes on the MSI package. Or, right. or we'd have to put them all on remote payload, and then you'll have to know which ones you need to specify based on where it is, which is not right. helpful at all. Right. So this is preventing overloading of attributes on certain elements. Which is already a thing in Burn. Yeah, Burn definitely has that. Right. We kind of went that, that's the too far in the other direction of avoiding child elements. <laughs> yeah. This is a good balance, I think. Somewhere in there, yeah. Somewhere in there is a balance. And Burns only had one revision, really. Every right. other feature has been improving the engine to work well with as minimal language changes as possible. Um, okay. That example helps me a lot. It might be worth, you might, if you have time, you might put it in here, because I think it shows why really well. And down here, right, payload information. Yeah, that's the considerations. Alternate proposal declined to require either source file or a child remote payload. Oh, yeah. Rename remote payload to remote exe payload. Remote MS mapping. Future payload elements would create their own remote payload, elements, which would be a child of the original element. So basically, when we implement all payloads can be remote, do we want to put all the attributes onto payload or should payload have a child element for the remote part of it? Right. Or you do this proposal here, which is you're, you're I mean, you're basically doing this, ah, jump around here. You're doing this remote exe payload. You're doing two right now because we're already getting that by creating these new XE package payload, remote MSI package payload. I mean, not complete. Oh, the question is, do we want to allow remote? Right, do we have to change the name to remote? Yeah, right, as opposed to overriding this and saying, hey, you can specify the product code here, and then if you specify all these things, you can remove source file attribute. Right. Right, that's essentially what it is, is. If you specify all these other things, you can remove source file if you do so. You need to specify all of these other parts. And do we create a separate remote MSI package payload element to, that enforces that at the schema level? Is that right? Yeah. Okay. But because we're not doing remote MSI, we're not going to worry about that right now. But that's probably Some the way to do it. people would be very disappointed. Does that include you? No. Okay. <laughs> no, you, the remote payload stuff is is yeah, it's 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 too much. It's bad enough now because you have to specify all the you know various bits of the of you know the the attributes of the file that needs to build a manifest that's secure. And I can't imagine what the authoring looks like for a remote MSI that includes the upgrade table. And the features. Oh, yeah, the features, right, right. I don't, yeah. That's what heat's for. Well, yeah. But at a certain point, it's like, don't you have the files? I don't know. Well, I mean, I'm I wondering guess if we should. Oh, go ahead. Nier's motivation was for like SQL Server, where there's tons of files that are hashed every single time you build. Oh, as as in a build optimization? Yeah. Like yeah. Put it into a wake okay. slip. Um. Sure. Put the wake slip next to the binaries and declare victory. So you don't have to hash so, it, every time. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, you no, know, my comment was more along the lines of how many naked MSIs do people 
need to reference that they don't also have locally. Uh, I yeah, I guess I can, you know, sure, you're right that you know you're avoiding um, unnecessary build hashing. Okay. I wonder if we should rename remote payload now for the well, ones I mean, that exist. This is that's what I'm that's what the proposal is for. <laughs> oh, the XE package payload, the source file will be act, will be optional if you specify all of the hash and everything on it. So there's like this I was trying to go two different ways. So either we get rid of remote payload and replace yes, it, it with... No, you say it in five. I just didn't read all the way to five. Okay. And then the alternate proposal was we leave XC package alone and we all we do is rename remote payload to remote XC payload. Yeah, which one of those is better? So I, I like my proposal better because it ends up with less attributes on an element. You clean up the MSI package, the XE package, so on and so forth. Yeah. When you're using the more esoteric attributes. Well, also IntelliSense, like you're, you just aren't going to see those other attributes. Yeah, yeah. The one yeah, thing just, about removing source file still works. Simple cases are still simple. When you're doing something that's more esoteric, you can still do it. It's just in a separate thing, which perfect sense to me. Yeah. So the trick though is that when you specify MSI package payload, you're going to get a list of um, of uh, attributes visible for the remote only scenario right that you shouldn't specify if you specify a source yeah i mean it's probably better to use xc package as a uh, example because we don't have msi package right now but you're right what's on xc package so on remote payload it's like description, certificate, thumbprint, hash, yeah. version, lots of stuff. Okay. Exe package, exe package payload. What's on MSI package? Oh, that's the... I'm I'm curious. Why do we care so much about the remote payload beyond its hash? It's just it gets it's what's harvested. So I mean, for, like a, for an XE, it's not a lot. Oh yeah. Well, no, but like, that's what I'm saying. For an XE, we have the certificate, public key, and thumbprint. That's all. Gone. Description, the, which are optional. But description, hash, product name, size, and version are all required. Size. Like the ca the cache ID, when it's figuring out what the cache folder's name should be, that's where some of the, like the version and stuff comes in. I thought we just used hash for XE package. For the cache folder name? It's yeah. not the hash. No, it's like package ID underscore version. Well, I know that's for MSIs, but I thought for for not for no, that's for everything. No, it's for, it's for all packages. I want to say you're wrong, but you've been in burn way more than I have over the past couple of years, so. Well, I haven't looked into the compiler side of it, so, <laughs> you, I mean, you could be right, but that's not what I remember. I thought we used the hash as the cache ID because for, for, for XEs because yeah, they go by because we didn't need like an MSI. We have to use like product code and version because they could be, yeah, you could have multiple hash. MSIs with the 
see, here's the exe. It's just the hash in the cache. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just the hash. Yeah, so the exes. I was like, why am I finding them? That's because all of the goods are first. Yeah, there we go. There's an exe. Yeah, so that's the hash. Xes just need the hash. I think all that other stuff is for progress, right? When we're displaying, we will send you that information about the things that are running, I think. That makes sense. Because yeah. we can Although also send that for we... the MSI, so you get nice default descriptions when the bundle's running along, something like that. Yeah. Although we could actually, we don't need that for the manifest for security reasons. Correct. So not could, not for security reasons. We could actually read it. Yeah. We need the um, hash and the size. Like that's what we need for most of the work. Well, we size for size for progress. I think it's used to calculate progress. Oh, download progress. Even calculate okay. progress. Size, something like that. Well, size is used with the hash. Like without that our SHA one verification would be a lot weaker. Because we make sure it's the right size so they can't generate a hash that collides even by making randomly sized files. Has that's okay, technically that has been demonstrated for SHA one. Yeah. I, yeah. I think if we bumped up to SHA two fifty six we could it's, also avoid size. Well, yeah, it wouldn't yeah. Well until not ten Shaw years from now where yeah. that's broken too. Yeah. Well <laughs> go go straight to SHA five twelve? Size that, size that narrows the plan. The, size, size narrows the the window. Anyway, this, this is a it's a blob, right? We need some minimal amount of data to identify the blob and make sure it's secure. That covers XEs. It would cover you know random I don't know side loaded files that you need for an XE. Um, not going to do the trick for MSI stuff. Putting the package ID, I guess the package ID, if we had remote MSI, putting the package ID on the payload makes sense. That's fine. I'm just trying to figure out what attributes live on these different things. There's the common package payload attributes. This one. Get your download URL, compress. Yes, no, default, good. Enable signature vacation, that's going to go away. So it's compressed, download URL, name, the destination name, which if you don't specify it will be the source file name. That defaults, yes, so that's easy. Okay. So name, download URL, and compressed. An MSI package doesn't have visible. Where is visible? It's on MSI package. Oh, it's on MSI pa Oh, this is only payloads. Right, it's on MSI package. MSI I don't package. have that element in here because I didn't change it. didn't change it, except that it removes the common payload elements, right? So it just removes the common payload elements. Got it. Yeah. So the common payload element. So it basically doesn't act as a payload, except to create the simplest payload if you specify source file. Got right. it. And download URL or file name. Mm-hmm. 
trick is that with MSIs and the way that we generate MSIs, you often have to specify a name, which is arguably something we should fix. But Sorry, why a name? And because if we generate cabs with the same names, then you can't have two MSI packages that both go to the same relative Correct. folder. Correct, right, right, right. And the way to override that is with the name attribute. Yeah. Which is perhaps a little confusing. Yeah. Do we did we ever do the thing where you do, you know, just directory ending with a backslash? I don't remember. If if we we're supposed to. I forget if okay. it works or doesn't work. It's one of those things that, you know, it's like I, I'm not sure because I feel like I've hit that before and went, Oh, right. we should have fixed that. <laughs> um I'm just thinking, how often am I going to have to specify MSI package payload? I don't think you would have to. It's it's mostly in the in the case if you want to again simplify the authoring for, um, you know, for the the self-contained versus web SKUs. No, but if I have two MSI packages in my chain, if I have two MSI packages in my chain and I've used media template and we don't change media template to output calves with the same name as the MSI, something I've toyed with, um, but, um, and ignore the 8.3 thing, it doesn't seem like it matters anymore. Um, so if you don't do that, then those two MSIs will end up being pulled in the bundle at the same location and all their calves will end up crunching over each other. Just right now, the default behavior as things are, you almost always have to specify a name for your MSI packages to prevent that from happening. And remember, um, I created an issue where that would be a build failure. And that would be good. <laughs> a build failure would be a good thing, um, but it doesn't solve the underlying problem of how much authoring do I have to do to get things to work correctly. It, it is, it, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mean, can't you, f we could fix that by adding a new attribute to the package element saying like cache folder or subfolder name or whatever. Yeah. Like so subfolder. that all the things go into that folder. Yeah. Folder. But it's only a problem for, for the, God, DVD layout, right? Hmm. If it's self-contained. True. It works. The attached container is fine with it. I think um, so. I think so. Uh, I forget okay, what good. the runtime extract behavior is. I well, think that's it's okay. But into the package cache, they're all separated. Yeah, yeah. And it's not getting in the package out of the attached container into the package cache. Yeah, maybe that's why you're okay. It's not a matter. It's only a matter until you create an external. And in that case, then hey, yeah, we're back into a case where. You don't need that attribute until until you start doing a non tash container layout, right? A non compressed bundle. Let's call it what it is. Um, but if you do, yeah. Yeah, something like, yeah, I don't know, syntactic sugar for the directory on the MSI package with the relative path to our relative folder or something like that, relative directory. Because that could actually happen to any of these guys. I don't know how often people dump all of their packages into one folder in their source tree if they're building uncompressed. If you're building compressed, you ignore it all of it. Just go, yeah, just take care of this for me. But if you're right. building uncompressed, that's different. You want to, people will almost always have, want more control over it because it ends up being the thing that ends up showing up on the, the DVD or whatever. Right, right, right. Or well, the, I would want 
I would want the build failure in both cases, though. I'm not arguing against the build failure. I 100% agree with you with the build failure. Like, it should not stomp silently. Um, build failure would be a good thing. Um, I'm just saying, like, even if it's compressed, even if there's runtime behavior where you wouldn't run into it, like if you tried to extract it with dark or mm -hmm. do a layout, you'd run into the same problem. Uh, does layout extract the attached container? I forget. No. No. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think it does. Dark does. And dark extracts everything out with its funky names, which makes it not as useful. Right. It, 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 with its compressed names, which makes it not as useful. Mm -hmm. Layout only does it downloads. Yeah, layout creates this your DVD. This was a big discussion. Yeah, lay, layout creates a DVD. And so you're like, in, if you lay out an attached container, it basically picks the file up and copies it. It's like, there, I laid it out for you. And you're like, <laughs> where's the packages? And you're like, they're right there. You're like, <laughs> inside it's that just thing. For the, it's just for the offline scenario. It is. Layout's just for offline. Okay. And if everything's attached, then you don't need any. You, you are good for offline, which is one of the reasons people like single self-contained executable. Um, Because the attached container just has like numbers. Yes. The names are in the manifest, so yes. the cab IDs are just numbers. That's why yeah. it works. And we got that wrong. We should have done hashes, but eh, next time. Then we would have free single instancing, but never mind that. Oh uh, yeah, good point. It was just one of those things. I one of many things I look at, and just like oh, should have fixed that. Anyway. Amongst all the yeah. other things. Simple missed opportunity. Yeah, and and it can be fixed at any time when I'm not buried with other things. So um, always 32-bit is much more important. <laughs> it's a user-facing thing. Anyway, um, remove all payload attributes. I just I'm. That's what I'm thinking. I'm trying to think what is the most common cases for people laying out bundles, and what are they going to expect and need. And I think relative dir is going to end up. Relative path, relative folder, relative directory, something like that. It's going to be. Does does burn use the word directory or folder, or does it even probably avoid it the problem? Yeah, it probably avoids the problem most of the time. There's no. No mention. Name is. Name uh, is the one, and the fact that it could be a relative. Path instead of a name, maybe, um, is the magic on it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, and if, if we do anything here, it, I agree, it, we should not be overloading name the way we are. Um, no, actually, but, but maybe this, this actually, maybe this fixes it, right? So if all the package elements here had a, uh, just for, we're going to call it relative directory. Oh, that's too long. Relative path, because it's relative directory. Relative, no, I want directory. Relative yeah. folder or relative directory. It's one of those words. Relative folder. So if they if they had or subfolder, I freaking don't know. Um, anyway, if if each of these had a relative folder, and I I don't like the name, then the payloads could have only a name on them. Is that true? No, they would need paths in them, but they would they would be relative to the package. What I'm saying is that then yeah, that would work. If the package provided the base relativeness and then all the payloads made themselves relative to that that would actually probably be the 80 percent case right you're like this xe it goes in this folder lay it out correctly right just well how I, it is I, i'm i'm concerned you're optimizing for a weird case i mean maybe now because media template is default and oh, all right i was going to say it it you know the simple fix is just to fix your your cab names right well, no, I worry about interleaving all that stuff. I don't know that I'd want it all in the root of my bundle interleaved. I, I would be worried about it all the time. I would be relying on Sean's error to make sure that it never, <laughs> that I, I don't get caught by this, right? As opposed well, to laying things out. I get it. I mean, but this this is this is nothing new, right? I mean, today you have this. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I've done bundles that lay stuff in the root and I just yeah. Yeah. I already already fixed the cab names. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's I, true. I, 
I, I worry about forcing everyone into their own subdirectory. Each package. I don't want to force it. I just want to make it okay, easy to okay. do. I want to make it. I, 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 I'm arguing that I think it's it's more common than not. Um, and I'm and the reason I'm bringing this one up is only because I'm trying to run through the implications of breaking these two things into separate packages, yeah, yeah, into separate yeah. elements. No. So I'm just trying to figure out like, and this is the one that's just kind of giving me download URL. I'm kind of on the fence of, but your scenario of being able to split the cache container, not a cache container, sold me. Download URL has to move. Got it. Um, and I argued that source file should stay for the very common case that you're not tweaking anything else. I'm 100% there too. That said, <laughs> so I'm I'm breaking this the clean separation. I don't know that I want to break it twice for relative directory. And I'm trying to make it a package. I'm trying to. I'm trying to say that's what that I'm it's actually better if it's just a package attribute. It's just like, yeah, this is on well, package. Yeah, and I'm saying it applies yes, to but... all child attributes or child payloads the same. But it's, it's just an attribute. It's a common package attribute. Do we have those, Sean? There's common. Are there any common package yes. attributes? Yeah. They should be at the bottom. Common package attributes? Chain package common attributes. Yeah, see, I'm I'm just arguing that that I should add another one to that. It's it's not important. Um, I just saw vital and it triggered the whole yes no thing. Um, freaking a. Um. Anyway. Yeah. I, I'm just arguing for another variable being in here. It doesn't change anything. We already have chain package common or yeah, common package attributes. So yeah, could 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 we could we create one? Create one. Sorry. <sighs> Sorry. Can we? Could we create? Could we do this for the user? I was thinking about that, but I don't know what I would use. We already have package cache ID. ID. Huh? Well, package ID might work. Cache or hash. Yeah, or cache or cache ID. ID. The cache ID. We already built that at, at build time, at compile time. So, yeah, yeah I, I forgot. What is cache ID? Where is it? Else is it used? I'm pretty sure that is the folder name that burn will use in the package cache. Right. It, then you're right. That's it. That's that's the same thing then, except using it for the source layout would work too. Although no, that's calculate. Really, you can set that. Yes, and people have abused it and broken themselves because of it. And yes, it works for MSI package as well. Wow, why do we do that? Do you really want to? Do you really want to know? Yes, it Bye, Jacob. A... Later, Jacob. Oh, see ya. Yeah, 11.30. It's going to be Visual Studio, right? Uh, framework. Done it. Really? Okay. Yep. It's not single instancing stuff, is it? Yeah. Oh. So yeah, I, I created an issue to have a warning or an error for that. I don't remember. Like, if they... If you have two packages with the same cache ID, that would be a warning as well. No, or error. That, that's this folder that, right here. It, sorry, you guys can see this. It's the actual ID in the package cache? Yes. No, why did we expose that? Oh. <laughs> oh, why did we? Oh, oh, no. I'm, I'm fine with removing it. Oh, yeah, we should not we should expose that. That was not what I was talking about. Okay, should, that, no, we should not expose that. Okay. But we do, so if we kept it, then we could use that to automatically create layout folders. Sure, at that, but at that point, we're just renaming it to a, we should rename it to a better name, but yeah. Okay. Fine. And I don't want to use ID on the package because 
Bob's point of, hey, I want to lay everything out in the root. That should be allowed too. It should be very straightforward. And I'm and I'm arguably the default, right? It's like, yeah, we'll just lay it all out in the root. You're good to go. Well, um, but I'm also fine. I, I'm also fine with the default being something that you know keeps the packages isolated. If you want to put them all in the root, then you could do you know, I don't know, relative directory equals dot. Because yeah, again, right. if you want to, okay. At this point, we're designing this thing called relative directory, which is fine. I think I was, I'm good. As soon as I saw the chain package attributes, the fact that we have them, and the fact that this new feature that we're talking about is one of them, would be one of them, and how it had a knock-on effect to everything else. So I think I'm good now. Um, source file, yes, no type. That's really strange. Really. Oh, they're all yes. No, I, I might have okay. messed that up. Copy and paste. I was like, did we really do that? That would be amazing. Um, how does anything yes. work? There is a source file. <laughs> <laughs> well, it almost works on package if you add this payload thing, but that's kind of weird anyway. All right. Okay. A hey, perfect use for AI. Package payload attributes is download URL. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Yep. 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 Okay. And. What does XC package payload have on it? XC package remote common attributes. It's actually used twice. Wait. It's only used in one place, but we have an attribute. Okay, fine. That should be gone. That should be gone. Then we have description, hash, product name, source file, size, version. Or you don't have and. If you have source file, then you don't need any of the others. Yeah. In fact, can you? Sean, is this an error? If you specify source file and hash? If not specify, the download URL must be specified. And all the other ones have if source file is specified, then you won't. Well, it must not be specified. That's Got it. Yeah, that's how we that's the logic in this. Yep, yep. So does that that basically means that XE package payload is remote oh but again it's not remote payload because you want the ability to have an if def on it, right? So I guess the question then is given the fact that XE package payload either has source file or all these other things. No, I guess you could have download URL and source file, right? That's allowed. Yeah. Right. That's allowed. So then the question is, given all those other things, should we have a remote XE payload in addition to XE, remote XE package payload in addition to XE package payload to make that less, more clearer, to make that clearer for IntelliSense? And I don't have a strong feeling on that. Uh, it's the same problem we have when when elements pivot. Yeah, it's like custom action where I've been threatening to make unique custom action elements for right. all the different things that custom action can be pivot into. And it would make it a better element if we did that. Um, but overall I think it's it's not it's not inconsistent, that's true. Yeah. Okay. All right. I guess my question there would be, where would you put the download URL if you did split it? On both. Both what? You, you specified that you would require the download URL on the remote one, and it would be optional on the XE package one, on the XE package payload. But not on XE package. No, it still wouldn't be on XE package. Right? Okay. Because it's not on XE package now. It 
just it all that does is it trims out all these. I'm thinking more of like MSI package, right? Because MS or MSI package payload. Because he has source file and then all the other common ones. But when it comes to when you want to make the remote one, whoops, when you want to make the remote one, uh, when you want to make the remote MSI package, it's going to get I don't know how many attributes on it, right? So at that point, the remote, when, if, when we support the, the MSI package payload having remote, right, now writing an MSI package payload is going to have all this stuff that you're going to be quite tempted to fill in, even though the right answer is source file. So then you may want a remote MSI package payload concept, which does not have source file on it and has everything else. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's true. But uh, I'm not sure how many, I think a lot of the things would have to be child elements, like upgrade table, feature table. Yeah, definitely. They're going to be, it's too complex for a you know, string. Or right. manually convert this to JSON. <laughs> yeah. um, still again, right? It's like, if you want to go remote, here's all this extra goo that you have to provide. I'm not sure we'd want to dirty it up this MSI package payload. I, I'm just questioning that, right? Because it, even being able to see those sub-elements and things, it's just going to, given what we've seen, allowing people to see all the attributes tends to lead us into a place where they're like, yes, I will fill all of them in. I'm well, worried about leading so, them down the was, wrong path. That was my impetus behind leaving source file on the package element. If you're, if, you're doing a child element, I mean, again, unless you're just blindly following IntelliSense and using it to check whether any child elements are allowed, what are you going to use? You'd use MSI package payload or download URL. Right. right? And I'm going to get, I'm going to, I want to specify down URLs. That's fairly common and, you know, for, it's, it's extremely common for any web um, yeah, download. Fair, so fair, there fair. you go. So it's not going to be that unusual to see it. So then you see, yeah. okay, now I have to create this extra element. Fine. Eh, annoying, but whatever. So I put download URL, I put source file on it. And then, oh my gosh, look at all these other things I have to specify now that I have this new element. And no, 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 actually, none of those other things matter unless you're doing a remote thing, which you're not doing because nobody does that except the people that are including SQL MSIs into their final package and want to avoid the build time. So that's why I'm trying to avoid is all the people are going to see those attributes and be like, oh, I need to fill this all out. That so seems I guess, crazy. That's where I'm... I guess my solution to that was to make it a build error if you do that. Oh, absolutely. You're absolutely right. I, it will definitely be a build error. It's just going to be a... They're going to go down the wrong path to start with, probably. Yeah, the other the other problem is that it's really hard to distinguish between what we call today a remote payload and what you point at when you use a download URL. It, it's confusing. Wait, I have a download URL, so I have to specify a remote payload? No, not necessarily. Only if you don't want oh, to include. Oh, yeah. To be clear, I'm I'm not I'm not I'm saying there would be two. There'd be MSI package payload, which is as it is today. And then there would be a remote MSI package payload, which would basically be MSI package payload plus all the other stuff at that point. Right. Well, what, I, no, and minus source file. So it's like copy download URL and then add all the other goo. Okay. I'm, I'm just saying right now it's confusing enough. I don't think that adding I, – I see what you're trying to do, by you, but you're, you're – you're avoiding the attributes in the common element, and this is a goodness. I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I'm on record as being on board with, with that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just saying, if you want to specify a download URL, and you're looking at the child elements, how are you going to distinguish between MSI package payload and MSI remote package payload? Uh, when your goal is to specify a remote package. I see. Yeah, you're, the the word there. Well, remote has never been a great word. Yeah, that's for fair. to specify what that is. That's fair. I, I I take your your meaning, uh, or your your I take your point and yes. 
counter with the fact that it's a crappy name. No. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, well, okay, I am defeated. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, it's only a flesh wound. Let's see, where do I go from here? I, I don't. Ah! I have no easy way through that. I mean, I, th I think at the end of the day, there's just going to be too many attributes, and like if you're if you're going past the common case of just giving the source file, then I think you're just going to have to look at all those extra attributes on the, the uh, XC package payload or whatever. I'll, I'll take that. The, I'm worried about moving download URL down then to this because I think download URL is not as uncommon. Me. Yeah. All right. The, Donald account uh, URL is not as uncommon to f to put it into that problem problematic area, which then would promote download URL back up with source file. Right, right. I, I uh, it's not an eighty percent, but it's probably at least a fifty percent. Yeah. So in that case, we're undoing the work that you do that we did under remote payload, albeit the badly named remote payload. Um, and now all of these remote only, oh God, yeah, we need a name for that. Um, not included payloads um, are showing up now on the on the element, whereas before we avoided them unless you went into the, you know, the child and, and did a remote payload. <sighs> yeah, I don't like that. So if we brought up source file and download URL. And relative directory. We could talk oh, about adding amazing. relative or not. I, I mean, we can talk. That, that's just another feature. Well, for me, it's the, it, it really helps when we have, you know, a consistent model and where we break consistency in favor of usability. It's more usable, but it, it, it's harder to explain. Mm -hmm. So the cleaner the separation, the better. So I worry about about promoting download URL. That said, it's completely consistent with the bug that I originally opened years ago, which is to separate. Mine wasn't to separate out package. Mine was to separate out the, the you know, quote unquote business logic of a particular package from its you know, delivery mechanism. Yes, and and enabling that is a good thing. So, again, part of it, uh, I don't like this because I also like there to be simplicity over complexity. We could, you know, we could argue that it's okay to duplicate some of those attributes. So source file oh, we duplicate yeah. because it's convenient and very common. So we reduce the, you know, we eliminate the need to, re to use a child element in the most common case. Yeah. Then you can argue that download URL is also pretty important. It's the thing that's been bugging me yeah. from, the, from the beginning of the separate elements. Um, it was like source file got promoted. Great. And then I've been saying, yeah, I worry about that definitely needs to move. Cause that's like most packages. And then the download URL is the next half of that yeah. or something like that. Yeah, I, I, I guess I would I would console myself that it's okay to, to duplicate those two. Sean, you have any opinions, thoughts? Uh, I guess it's okay. <laughs> I mean, my original proposal didn't even have source file promoted. Right. <laughs> yeah, but to have one element be two where the other element has one attribute on it, it's not going to look good all the time. It's it's architecturally pure, but it's annoying. Oh, I, I appreciate the hardcore nature of that yeah. separation. <laughs> You'd be like, why is it this way? Well, let's go through all the other scenarios that you don't care about. <laughs> Uh, right. And show you why this is the way it is, and it's like, mm, it only some really weird people would spend two hours discussing. 
Oh, wait. Oh, God. If we move up download URL, I think that takes care of the case. That's, I think, the thing that's been bothering me. Yeah. And I'll deal I, with I'll, name. I'll, and I'll deal with name. But, and, and even name, I don't like the way name works anyway, so that's why I'm not fighting to move name up. <laughs> um, and instead, I'm like, we need to get rid of cache ID. That never should have been exposed. And um, move, replace cache ID with a relative path. And that gets me my other scenario, I think. And then I'm pretty much covered. I think that's where I end up. But I, we're, we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. That set, right? Yeah, that'll right. work. Okay. I think it's, I think it'll work well. Getting rid of, hey, and look, by getting rid of remote payload, we get rid of all the problems of naming it. It's true. <laughs> For once, a positive bonus of picking the harder way through. I suppose. I suppose. Although it's still a concept, and we don't even explain the concept very well. So. Oh well, yeah. Now that you mention that, I mean, a download URL is still a remote payload. Yes, that's why remote was never the right word for it, and we yeah. knew it back yeah. when we needed that. So, all right, we're not going to solve that problem now. We're just not. It's not going to happen right now. What are we are going to do? We're going to go questions, comments. Now that we've chased everybody away, that's one good way to solve not having to answer anybody's questions or comments. Jacob oh, yeah. already said adios. We still says, I see three viewers. I don't know if this report is anywhere near correct. Um, anything else? That feels like enough. Um, we will. Come I have enough, I think, to keep me busy. So we'll be back in. Two weeks ish. That's hey, March. No, February 4th. God, I get to March that fast. Wow. Mm. February 4th. Ooh. That's going to be interesting. I have well, to get my, my kindergartner goes back to school on that day. So I have to figure out. I think I'll be back before 9 30. I have to figure out if I'll be back by 9 30. I think I will. Let's hold it where it's at. I'm going to go double check that over the next uh, week. And let's assume that we'll be back at the same time, same place right here in two weeks. Um, that would be February 4th. We'll do this again. Uh, and it will be this again. We will be talking about other things with deep questions about the appropriate way to solve them um, and getting them in. And I am going to go update this whip for, uh, with the um, getting rid of the always 32-bit, not calling it architecture, but calling it bitness. So on that note, uh, I think we're good here. We'll be back in two weeks. All of you have a good time. Bye. Bye. Bye.